السلام عليكم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين There seem to be a few definitions for politics and many views as to where Islam and the Quran stand when it comes to politics and running a state. Because generally speaking, religion deals with, the, with honesty, truthfulness, and true justice, whereas politics commonly known to be mixed with trickery, deception, dishonesty, and even injustice at times, Therefore, it is concluded that the religion and running of a state should be separated. Is there such a thing as Islamic government or Islamic state? And if so, how is it defined? Today, we will discuss the Islamic and the Quranic perspective on politics as it relates to governing a state, a nation. But first, Let's define what is politic. The word siyaset, or translated as politic, which is not in the Qur'an, it's not mentioned in the Qur'an, but rather in hadith and tradition, as mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, كانت لبني إسرائيل أنبيائي فسوسهم There were uh, prophets among Bani Israel who administered or managed their affairs. They strategized for them or made policies for them. Unfortunately, today the word siyaset or politic has gotten a bad rap, bad reputation among ordinary people or even intellectuals. Many define or associate siyaset or politics with lies, with deception, trickery. Hence, many think it should be separated from religion, which is all about honesty, truth, and justice. In reality, their definition of siyaset, politic, is incorrect. Siyaset has two meanings in Islam. One is punishment. The other meaning is tadbir, or, ad or devising, making policy, or strategizing, or planning. Tadbir could be about strategizing on something unpleasant, like a war, or something good, like economic development, uh, developing relationships, etc. All related to governing or state activity, managing a state's affairs. Unfortunately, today we have Machiavellians who follow Niccolo Machiavelli, the Italian politi politician and philosopher, who said, the end justifies the mean. In other words, the politicians can lie, cheat, deceive, and do whatever they need to in order to achieve their goal, all described in the history of political science. In fact, Machiavellianism is also the name of a personality trait characterized by absence of morality, a lack of empathy, and a focus on self-interest and personal gain. This is a perverted but unfortunately common definition of politics. Whereas the word politics, which comes from the word policy, has been defined in dictionaries as the following. The activities, actions, and policies that are used to manage and hold a government or to influence a government. It's also mentioned the activities of the government or the study of these activities. Due to wrong perception, Many think politics mean trickery, mean deception or dishonesty. And therefore, politicians must do these things in order to uh, survive. They say, they even say this, so-and-so is political or plays politics, meaning he can scheme underground and deceive others. Therefore, based on this definition, People think politics and religion must be separated as religion deals with 
honesty and truth. They have another reason, of course, as well, which is religious people or theocracy should be kept out of the government. But that is a discussion for another session. So this is their logic. First, they start with a wrong definition of siyasat. Then they conclude, based on that definition, the religion and state must be separated. We are saying, just like we do have bad siyasat, bad politics, with wrong notions and wrong definition, we do have right politics, correctly defined politics as well. Why do we keep talking about the wrong politics and never talk about the opposite, which exists in Islam? The Machiavellianism today does not have many followers. Although in practice, many politicians do often act like it, but in the political science arena, it does not carry much weight. Why? Because the science and history have shown that trickery and deception and lies in a government are eventually exposed and lead to their fall especially in many democratic or even some autocratic societies. Islam's siyasat or politic is straight, honest, and just. In early Islam, some people suggested that if we have a treaty, an obligation with a group of people, and then we re realize reneging the treaty is to our interest, to our benefit, we have the right to break it. However, Quran immediately responded. What did it say? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فما استقاموا لكم فاستقيموا لهم إن الله يحب المتقين So long as they are true to you, be true to them. Indeed, Allah loves those who keep their duty. Chapter 9, verse 7 as long as they are straight with you, be straight with them in your promise, in your treaty. This is taqwa. If you do the opposite, you have not kept your duty to Allah. Yes, Islam says when it comes to war, you can use schemes and military tactics in order to get ahead of the enemy. So part of making policies or politics is related to war. Even in one-on-one -on -one combats, you can utilize tactics like evade, uh, sidestep, turn, and so forth, as the enemy will be using their own tactics as well. Within a war framework, you can have scouts or spies near the enemy camp, as they will be likely doing the same thing. In other words, war is made up of tactics and maneuvers. However, you cannot apply any of these in peacetime while managing the country, running a state, and dealing with peacetime relationship with others, internal or external. Therefore, the correct siyasat and politics is the policy of إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ Indeed, Allah enjoins justice and doing good being kind, chapter 16, verse 90. If you judge, judge in equality, in equity between them. For Allah loves those who judge justly, chapter 5, verse 42. Say, my Lord enjoined, enjoined justice, chapter 7, verse 29. These were kind of Quranic policies that were implemented in early Islam by the Prophet and his companions who followed his footsteps. And with these policies, Muslims were victorious, not just in the hands, uh, in, the, in, the, in the lands that they uh, conquered, but in the hearts. They stormed hearts, with such straight, honest, and just attitudes, as a result, Islam has spread over one and a half billion today. 
They participated in several wars, but all ended with the least number of casualties. All with the energy and movement generated by few steadfast and honest men and women under the guiding light of the Qur'an and the Prophet's leadership and policy making. That's why Montgomery Watt, the Scottish historian, orientalist, priest, and academic, wrote a book with the title, Muhammad, the Prophet, and the Statesman. This is the type of politics we are referring to here. Not deception, not treachery, not playing games, and not colonial colonialism. This is a wrong way of thinking that siyasat is all about stealing, lying, cheating, and trickery. Hence, for this reason, we must separate the religion and politics. The questions should be, which politics? Whose politics? Because if we go with what is common perception today, it misleads people into thinking any group or party that comes to power must be dishonest and must lie and cheat in order to achieve their goal. No, that is not the case. We must reevaluate and cleanse such culture and mindset. Islam supports policies or politics that confirm, that conform to justice. Policies that do not take away people's freedom and do not deceive people. Often we see a clergy, a mullah, a man of religion who does not have the qualification to make policies is giving opinions on politics and how to, on how to run a state or worse, consider himself a politician and qualified to run a government. Often in a speech talking about things that must be kept secret. They are state secrets. But he has no idea. He does not realize as Qur'an gives instruction. If we go to chapter uh, 4, verse 83, it says, When there comes to them some matter touching public safety or fear, they divulge it. They announce it publicly. If they had only referred it to the messenger or to those charged with authority among them, those among them who are able to think out the matter would have known it or proper investigators would have known about it. Chapter 4, verse 83. But no, this is to all so-called religious and wannabe political leaders who think they are expert in policy making and just run their mouth in public, divulge state secrets. We will do such and such. We have the capability to do such and such. Allah says, leave it to the expert. Leave it to those who have the competency. The job of policy making must go to the one who qualifies or voted in by people. Now, now that we've defined what right politic is, what does an Islamic state or Islamic government look like? How does good politics play a role in a truly Islamic government? What are the qualifications for a government to be called Islamic or approved by Islam? As we have said many times, Islam is a way of life. It is a system, not limited to few rituals as many religions are. Like its social and economic aspects, the political aspect of Islam is based on sound spiritual and moral foundations and is guided by divine instructions. The political system of Islam is unique in its structure, its function and its purpose. It is pragmatic. It's not a theoretical system in the sense that a certain class of people assume divine rights, 
hereditary or otherwise, and position themselves above other citizens beyond accountability. Nor is it a system whereby a special interest group takes power. It is not even a democracy, quote-unquote, in some aspect of its popular sense, the way democracy may be defined today. It is something different from all that. To appreciate the political outlook of Islam, one only needs to know that it is based on following principles. And by the way, any society or government that call themselves Islamic, if they're not based on the following principles, they're not Islamic. And today, virtually all of them do not qualify as Islamic. Number one, every deed of the Muslim individual or group of individuals must be inspired by and, and guided by God's law, the Qur'an, which is the constitution chosen by God for his true servants. Of course, we're applicable, and we will touch on this a bit later. Qur'an says, And unto you have we revealed the scripture with the truth, confirming, confirming whatever scripture was before it, and guarding it in safety. So, judge between them by that which Allah has revealed, and follow not their desires away from the truth which has come to you. For each we have appointed a divine law, and an open pathway. So, judge between them by that which Allah has revealed, and follow not their desires. Who is better than Allah for judgment to those who have certainty, yaqeen, in their belief? Chapter 5, verses 47 through 50. Of course, there is a lot to be said about this verse. There are other verses. Verses like, Indeed, this Qur'an does guide to that which is most right and best. Chapter 17, verse 9. Number two, sovereignty, power, and authority in an Islamic state does not belong to the ruler or head of the government, nor even to the people themselves. It belongs to God. And the people as a whole exercise it by trust from him to enforce his laws and enact his will. The Muslim ruler is only an acting executive chosen by the people to serve them according to God's law. This is the foundation of the Islamic State and is wholly consistent with the general outlook of Islam on the universe of which God is the creator and in which he is the sole sovereign. In the Qur'an, one comes across statements like this. Authority, power, and sovereignty belongs to none but God. Blessed be he in whose hands is dominion, authority, and he has power over all things. Chapter 67, verse 1. Or, truly, God does command you to render back your trusts to those who are due. To, to those they are due. And when you judge or rule between people, you judge with justice. How excellent indeed is the teaching which he has given you. Chapter 4, verse uh, 58. Or, verses like, لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ to him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and all affairs are referred back to Allah. Chapter 5, verse 57. And to God belongs the dominion, the authority of the heavens and the earth, and to him is the final goal of all. Chapter 24, verse 42. Number three, the goal of the Islamic state or government is to administer 
justice and provides security and protection for all citizens, regardless of color or race or religion, in conformity with the stipulation of God in his constitution, which is Qur'an. The question of religious or racial minority does not even come up so long as they are law-abiding and peaceful citizens, just like other citizens. The Qur'an says, and says it clearly, <clears throat> Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, kunu qawamina bil qisti shuhada alillah, walau ala anfusukum, awil walidayn, wal aqrabayn, in yakun ghaniyan aw faqiran, Allahu awla bihima. O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah. Even if it is against yourselves or your parents or your relatives and whether it be against rich or poor. For Allah can best protect both or above it all. Follow not the desires of your hearts. So it swerves you to lapse. So you slip. And if you distort justice or decline to do justice, indeed Allah is well aware of all that you do. Chapter 4, uh, verse 135. Yet we have a so-called Islamic government who dismisses a distinguished professor in a university with bias toward his non-Islamic religion. We have so-called Islamic republics who continually discriminate against minorities of other faiths or sects. Number four, formed for the above-mentioned purposes and established by, to enforce God's law, the Islamic state cannot be controlled by any political party of non-Islamic platform or subjected to foreign powers. It has to be independent to exercise its due authority on behalf of God and his cause. This originates from the principle that a Muslim is the one who submits to God alone and pledges loyalty to him, to his law, offering utmost cooperation and support to those who administer the law and observe its stipulation. It is incompatible with Islam, therefore, for a Muslim nation to pledge support to any political party of a non-Islamic platform or to yield to a foreign non-Islamic government or non-Islamic aims, one who has non-Islamic aims, as the Quran says in chapter 24, Allah has promised those among you who believe and do good work that he will surely make them to succeed the present rulers in the earth even as he caused those who were before them to succeed others and that he will surely establish for them their religion which had you know which he has approved for them and will give them in exchange safety after their fear. Chapter 24, verses 51 and 55. Number five, the ruler, you know, the Islamic ruler, any ruler in an Islamic land, is not a sovereign or authoritative power over the people. He is a representative employee chosen by the people and derives his authority from his obedience to God's law. The law which binds the rulers and the people alike by a solemn contract over which God is the supervisor. The political contract of Islam is not just between the administration and the public alone. It is between, you know, these combined on one side and God on the other. And it is morally valid and binding only as long as the human sides fulfill their obligations to the divine. The Quran says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u Rasul wa ulil amri 
منكم فإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم تؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر ذلك خير وأحسن تأويلا All you who believe obey God and obey the messenger of God and those charged with authority among you If you differ in anything among yourselves refer it to God and his messenger if you do believe in God and the last day. That is best and most suitable for final determination. Chapter 4, verse 59. This verse, of course, all these verses we can talk about hours, but this verse refers to obeying God, means his law, and obeying his messenger, and obeying the authority whom people have chosen and charged with the duty of governing. Someone from among people, someone like you, but elected by you. Some people delete this part, those charged with authority from among you, and say, therefore, the authorities should not be obeyed. This is incorrect. If the ruler is truly chosen by people, and acts according to God's law, he should be obeyed. The verse continues and says, if you differ with him or amongst yourself, refer to Allah through Quran and his messenger through his tradition. On the other hand, or on the other extreme side, we have people who cite this verse and obey the rulers no matter how despotic they may be, no matter how de deviant they may be from God's law and obedience to him. So we have both extremes. Obedience to those charged with authority is conditioned in this verse by their own obedience to God's law and the traditions of his messenger. In one of his conclusive statements, Prophet Muhammad said that there is no obedience or loyalty to any human being, ruler or otherwise, who is not himself obedient to God and bound by his law. Obedience here means the ruler's command or requests are made in conformity with the Quran and Sunnah. Even beyond that, also orders from those in authority should conform to laws of reason and common sense which constitute a large sphere of civic laws that God has left for human beings, humans, within their society to come up with using their reason and intellect. The early successors of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him understood this principle very well and declared in their first statements of policy that they were to be obeyed and helped by the public as long as they themselves obeyed God and that they had no claims to obedience from the people if they were to depart from the way of God. You see? Number six. The rulers and administrators in a truly Islamic state must be chosen from among the best qualified citizens on the basis of their merits of virtue, fitness, expertise, and competence. Racial origin or family prestige or financial status do not themselves make any potential candidates more or less qualified for, you know, high public office. They neither promote nor hinder the merits of the individual. Every candidate must be judged on his own merits. The candidates may be chosen by public consent through general elections, or they may be selected and authorized by public leaders who are in turn entrusted to leadership by the free will of the various sections of the society. 
Therefore, an Islamic state can have as many representative councils or municipal governments as desired. The right of election or selection and the conduct of administration are governed by God's law and must be aimed at the best interest of the society as a whole. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Whoever entrusts a man to a public office, where in his society there is a better man than his candidate, he has betrayed the trust of God and his messenger and the Muslims. In a political sense, this means that, morally speaking, the voters cannot be indifferent to public events and that whenever they cast ballots, must vote for, you know, after careful consideration of the candidate of their choice, vote for those who seem to be the most qualified. In this way, the state would have the best possible safeguards of security and responsible citizenship, something which many modern democratic states lack. Number seven, after people made their choice through election or selection of their ruler, every citizen is enjoined, is commanded to supervise within his means, of course, the conduct of the administration and question its handling of public affairs whenever one sees anything wrong with it. If the administration betrays the trust of God and the public, it has no right to continue in office. It must be ousted and replaced by another. And it is the responsibility of every citizen to see to it that this is done in the public interest. The idea of, by the way, the idea of inheriting power or Lifetime government, staying in power till he dies, does not exist in a true Islamic state, Islamic government. Number eight, although the ruler, the, the, you know, whether the ruler is a president, vice president, or prime minister, whoever it is, although he is chosen and appointed by the people, his first responsibility is to God and then to the people. His office is not just symbolic, nor is his role simply an abstract role. He is not a helpless puppet whose function is to sign papers or carry out the public will invariably, whether their will is right or wrong. He must exercise actual powers on behalf of the people for their best interests in accordance with God's law because he has a dual responsibility. One, on one hand, he is accountable to God for his conduct and on the other hand, he is responsible to the people who have put their trust in him. He will have to give full account before God of how he treated his people or their representatives. But here it is, both the ruler and the people will also have to give a full account before God of how they treated the Qur'an, how they regarded God's law, which he has given as a binding force. It is by the governor's responsibility to the people that he handles their affairs in the best common interest and it is by his accountability to God that he should do so according to God's law and obedience to him. Hence, the political system of Islam is fundamentally different from all other political systems and doctrines known to mankind. And the ruler is not to govern the people according to their own desires. He is to serve them by making justice a common law. 
by making their genuine obedience to God a regular function of the state and by making sound morality a noble task of the administration. They should be doing noble tasks routinely. Number nine, although the Quran is the constitution of the Islamic State, Muslims are commanded by God to handle their common affairs through shura or consultive methods, especially in affairs that Quran is very general or high level or silent. There are many things that Quran is silent about. This makes room for legislative councils and consultative bodies on the local as well as the national and international levels. Every citizen in the Islamic State is enjoined to offer his best advice to on common matters and must be entitled to do so. The rulers must seek the advice of the specialists, the professionals, the experienced people in the state. But this does not in any sense deny the right of average citizens who must speak out whenever the occasion arises. You know, Islamic history provides the background on how the chief rulers, you know, uh, the heads or early khulafa were questioned, advised, and corrected by common people, men and women alike. The principle of shura, mutual consultation, is so fundamental in Islam that not only demands people to speak their mind, but also to do so in the sincerest and most effective manner for the best interest of the society. Consultive methods in politics or in any other field for that matter, like economic, social, and civic matters, are not only a democratic formula of government, but a religious, a religious injunction and a moral duty enjoined upon the rulers as well as people. Beside his constant practice of this principle in both war and peacetime, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that to give good counsel or advice is so important that it is considered the essence of religion. The purpose of such consultation is to ensure that God's law is observed and that the rights of citizens are honored and their obligations are fulfilled. To prevent the rise of professional politics and counteract the underground politicians of opportunist platforms, the Prophet, peace be upon him, speaking on the authority of God, said that whoever speaks be it by the way of counsel or in another context, must say the right and good things. He must say the right and good things, or else he had better keep silent. This is to warn counselors and advisors against selfish inclinations or temptations. It is to guarantee that counsel is given with the sincerest intentions and in the best interest of the public because it is authorized by God, carried on his behalf and aimed at the common welfare. Seeking of counsel, shura, on the part of the ruler and rendering it on the part of the public is not a matter of choice or a voluntary measure in Islam. It is a religious ordinance or duty. Prophet ﷺ himself, although was wisest, infallible, and unselfish, was not above the law or an exception to the rule, as God instructs him in chapter 3, verse 159. It was by that mercy of Allah that you, Prophet Muhammad, dealt so leniently with them. Had you been harsh and hard-hearted, they would have surely deserted you. Therefore, pardon them and ask forgiveness for them. Consult with them 
in the matters and affairs. When you have made the decision, put your trust in Allah. For Allah loves those who put their trust in Him. Listing the characteristics of the believer, Mu'mineen, the Qur'an makes clear mention of mutual consultation, shura, as a matter of faith. وَالَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِرَبِّهِمْ وَأَغَامُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورًا بَيْنَهُمْ وَمِمَّا رَزَغْنَامْ يُنْفِقُونَ And those who answer the call of their Lord and establish regular prayers, who conduct their affairs by mutual consultation, who spend out of what we bestowed on them. Chapter 42, verse 38. Number 10. Under the political system of Islam, every citizen is entitled to enjoy freedom of religion and conscience. This is very important principle. I repeat, under the political system of Islam, every citizen is entitled to enjoy freedom of religion and conscience, also freedom of thought and freedom of expression. All human beings are free to develop their potentials, to work and compete, to earn and hold positions and property, to approve and disapprove of things, according to their honest judgment. But freedom is not and cannot be absolute or else will lead to chaos and anarchy, as we discussed in the uh, last session. Hence, God's law and otherwise civic laws are in place to enforce if any action is taken against community's best interest. If an individual takes an independent attitude or opinion on a certain matter of public concern and finds the majority taking a different attitude, different approach, that individual at the end must side with the majority to maintain what? Solidarity and cooperation and unity, provided the majority's decision is not against God's law. Yet, in the process of forming a public opinion, one is fully entitled to express one's opinion and try to argue his point of view. But, you see, when it becomes clear that the majority have chosen a different course, then one is bound to go along and be with them. Because it's, the matter in question is no longer under individual consideration or deliberation, but is undergoing public implementation or answers to the believers. And hold fast all together by the rope which Allah stretches out for you, and be not divided among yourselves, and remember with gratitude Allah's favors upon you. And there may spring from you a nation who invites to goodness and enjoins right conduct and forbids what's wrong. Such are they who are successful, but, but be not like those who are divided amongst themselves and fall into disputes after receiving clear signs. Chapter 3, verses 103 through 105. And then there are other verses like, uh, And obey Allah and His Messenger, and do not fall into disputes, lest you lose heart, and your power depart means you lose your strength as you divide. Chapter 8, verse 46. Number 11. The governance of the Islamic State is a public trust to which administrators are entrusted by the word of God as well as by the common consent of the people with God being the supreme owner and authority. Whoever represents him in the top office must be faithful to the supreme authority. He must be a believer in God 
and with majority of the citizens being Muslims, whoever assumes the highest office must be a true Muslim. These measures are taken to serve the common interest and fulfill the obligations of the state to God as well as all the citizens. They are also to secure and honor the rights of minorities. It is unfortunate for humanity that this ruling of Islam has been poorly understood and badly distorted. The fact of the matter is that this ruling is not discriminatory against minorities, but is rather protective and assertive of their rights. Whoever wishes to be a law-abiding citizen of the Islamic State is welcome to do so and shares with others the duties of citizenship. His being a non-Muslim citizen must not lower his status or drop him to a second-class citizen. Like his Muslim counterparts, he needs to be law-abiding citizen and exercise his rights in a responsible manner. These include paying their civic duties, paying taxes, etc., etc. Similarly, if such citizens want to administer their personal lives in matters like marriage, divorce, food, inheritance, and so on, according to Islamic laws, they are welcome to do so. But if they wish to administer their personal affairs according to their own religious teachings, they are absolutely free to do so. And no one can hamper their rights to exercise them. But in the matters of public interest and common affairs, they must abide by laws of the state. At any case, they are no less entitled to protection and security than any other citizen. This is the teaching of the Qur'an, the practice of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Islamic history reflects it. For example, it is recorded that Umar ibn, Umar ibn Khattab, as a Khalifa, he was a Khalifa at the time, once was passing by a place where he found an old Jewish man in a pitiful condition. The old man was just looked horrible. Omar inquired about the man and asked about his situation. Then, in a regretful tone, he said to the man, We collected tribute from you, you know, jizya from you, when you, when you were able. Now you are deserted and neglected. How unjust to you Omar has been. After he finished his remark, he ordered regular pension for the old man and made it effective immediately. These were men and companions who received their political orientations at the hands of messenger of God, peace be upon him who in turn had been taught by God. These teachings are recorded and reflected in verses like, Allah does not forbid you to be kind, to act justly to those who have neither made war on your religion nor expelled you from your homes. Allah loves the just. Allah only forbids you with regard to those who fight you for your faith and drive you out of your homes and support others in driving you out from turning to them for friendship and protection. Chapter 60, verses 8 and 9. Finally, it is categorically wrong to compare the Islamic State and its Muslim leader with a secular state where it is theoretically conceivable to have a leader or a head of a state who may, be belong, who may belong to a minority group. The comparison is erroneous and misleading for several reasons. First, it assumes, however superficial, it is sounder than the Islamic ideology. Such an assumption or premise is pretentious. Secondly, the duties and rights of a head of a state under Islam 
are quite different from those of his counterpart in a secular order, as we outlined above. Thirdly, the modern secular spirit is for the most part a redemptive apologetic institution, a case which does not apply to Islam. We just covered 11 points or 11 characteristics that make up a true Islamic government or Islamic state. Now, which one of the Muslim nations or so-called Islamic republics today have any of the above characteristics? If the answer is none, therein lies the problem of Ummah today. One might say such a perfect government only happens in utopia. Who can have such policies with such good politics in this day and age? Who can implement such system for real? Well, it did happen, and it can happen. At the end of the day, what it really takes is for heads of state to be true Muslims. Which translates into what? Being honest, the, the, you know, the, the head of a state being honest, God-conscious, God-fearing, obedient to God, and respectful of his laws. Individual who feels responsible before him. If you get individuals with such qualities at the helm running the government, then all other things fall into place. This is why Prophet, peace be upon him, for the first 13 years in Mecca, worked on individuals, one by one, on their belief system, on their moral characters and convictions, before anything else. Once Muslims' hearts were filled with Islam and truly submitted to God and their moral, moral characters were developed, then they were victorious in many fronts and became one of the greatest civilizations. In conclusion, a true Islamic state provides equal rights, freedom, security to all citizens in a number of democratic ways, and acts in the interest of the whole society as its government body holds itself responsible before God first and people next. The politics of an Islamic state, or shall we say, policy making of an Islamic government, is not based on lies, cheating, deception, treachery, and unjust policies. It does not discriminate, and its leaders, its heads of states, do not see themselves above the law above God's law or any civic laws and legislations. While all this may sound ideal, outstanding, and perfect, it did exist once and can happen again. Traces of it are implemented today here and there in many societies that are called democratic. One can imagine, just imagine, what sort of nations it would produce if it was implemented as a whole? We ask Allah to give us, give Muslim nations such selfless and truly believing men and women to lead them so they can exemplify how a truly Islamic state is governed and functions. We ask Allah to strengthen our Iman as individuals Unite us so together we build societies made up of truly believing men and women with potentials to lead Muslim nations. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wal Asri in al Insan al Afi Qusr. Illa al Ladina Amanu wa Amilu Salihat. Wat Wasa ubil Haqi. Wat Wasa ubil Sabr. Wassalamu ala manit Tabar al Huda.